Welcome to the Scrapbook of Life with Teresa Khalil, a podcast on my journey to understand life, solve its mystery, and live it fully. And on my journey, I came across the Farus, living a life led by many questions that changed the trajectory of his life. What if I die now? Will God accept my deeds if I did them to go to heaven and not out of love to God? What is the path of human happiness? Questions that led him from Christianity, Catholicism, to diving deep into it, to leaving it, parting uh, to Islam, to leaving Islam, and in between, New Age, Buddhism, agnosticism, atheism, and then back to Islam again, and then digging deep into Islam. So the Farus, welcome to the scrapbook of life. Well, thank you, and assalamu alaikum, and uh, you've done your homework, I see. <laughs> <laughs> wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Come, and with me, flip through the pages of the scrapbook of life. I usually start by where every human being life begins, as we know. Uh, which is birth. Can you tell me in a nutshell your birth story, if you know, if they told you, how was it? What was the situation of the family, the the circumstances of the world at that time? So in a nutshell, and I start by saying, it all began when once upon a time, a baby was born and they named him. <laughs> yeah, so um, I was born. Um, what did they the, name uh... you? Oh, Michael. I was na- um, I was actually named. Uh, I'm actually a junior, so I have the same exact first, middle, and last name as my father. I was born in the late '70s. Um, you know, I, I wasn't totally much aware of the surroundings at you know that time. I do know, you know, it was the uh, Carter era in the United States, pre Reagan. Um, you know, I know at the time, you know, the United States had some turmoil with Iran, which is continuing on uh, to this day. Um, and I know that my uh, when I was born, uh, my grandmother actually wrote a uh, poem. You know, so I'm the only child that has a poem written about their birth in my family. Mm, but why? Like you were the first. Yes. Oh. <laughs> I know I was born like in the wee hours of the morning, uh, they actually, um, my mom went into labor. They actually had, you know, back then, um, doctors were on call. So, you know, the doctor actually got, um, either he came stumbling in, he was either half awake or half drunk. I don't know, (laughs) but, um, you know, in the wee hours of the night to, um, deliver me. So, and, uh, you know, I know I was three weeks late, which, uh, you know, my due date was actually in April, but I was born in early May. Mm. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, the joke was, you know, is I didn't want to leave my mother's side. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so you came out to this life and you were raised as um, like a Catholic christian yeah so on um, my father's side it's um they were catholic on my mother's side they were protestant agnostic and some jewish as well no. um you know so i um was raised catholic um originally the catholic church wouldn't baptize me because my parents were married in a protestant church so then my parents had to go get remarried in a Catholic church in order to um, baptize me and raise me Catholic. Uh-huh. That's interesting. <laughs> yes. It, I, and I don't think now that they would, you know, care at all. But back then, you know, things were a little different. If you look back now at your childhood, what are the highlights of this period? I would say, you know, the 80s was, you know, definitely a, a highlight. Um, you know, one, you know, growing up in a, a typical American suburb, uh, you know, you played baseball, you played lots of sports, um, you were always outside. Um, so, you know, riding bikes, jump, you know, we had, uh, you know,
know, bike jumps. So there were like, you know, hills to do bike tricks on. We had a lot of um, woods and rivers to go exploring in, find animals. And there was always something to do. You're always um, outside. You're always doing something, um, you know, playing with other kids, socializing, you know, playing um, organized sports and, you know, obviously going to school. So I would say there was definitely a, a balance um, growing up in the 80s. There was a balance between uh, schoolwork, social time, you know, being outside, uh, you know, playing sports. Um, but, you know, the United States was a lot more balanced um, back then. And, you know, one of the things that I find interesting is when I visit um, my wife's uh, country of Jordan, it reminds me a lot of, you know, where I grew up, just a Muslim version. So you see kids outside playing all the time. It could be 10 o'clock at night. And kids are playing soccer on the, um, you know, uh, basketball courts and stuff like that. So there was less technology. Um, not that we didn't have technology. We had Nintendo and you had VCRs and stuff back then. But, uh, you know, nowhere near today. So you had, a, I would say, a happy childhood. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I see that you are like out all the time. Usually when someone is a questioner, he like is usually inside on his own reading a lot. But how come your childhood is outgoing like this and you started questioning? I, you know, I would say I was, I was very um, hyper and athletic and, and uh, you know, I'm still much, you know, of an out. Um, doorsman. I still prefer being outside a lot. Uh, you know, by I I think the question we talk, referred to was you know what happened when I died. That like, popped in my head out of nowhere, kind of when I was eleven or twelve. I think that's when I. So when it comes to reading, I was actually the first person in my age group to learn to read. Uh, and so I think I, I was exciting about reading up until about age nine and then i guess it got kind of um you know old and boring by a certain point but i started to pick up reading again was after i had that question what happened if i die soon and coming from a christian background i decided to um you know read the bible to find out so so 11 or 12 you started thinking what if i die now yes and the question popped up from, you don't know from where. Because as yeah. Eckhart Tolle say, uh, uh, the thoughts happen to us. We don't think, but uh, thoughts happen to us. So that was a thought that came to you. And yes. according to Catholicism, what do, what is the answer of what will happen if I die now? So within Catholicism, it's uh, you know pretty complex because they have... Um, heaven hell and purgatory and in the catholic books and the catholic doctrine it's different than i would say layman's catholicism because and they're i would say they're two totally different religions so in traditional catholicism like the only people that go to like straight to heaven are i mean it's been changing now but we're going back to you know the doctrines that were around in the 80s and 90s when you actually go into the books not talk to people you know in the books it was basically only the most pious catholics who were saints and gave up a life and weren't committing one of the list of major sins that took people to hell would go straight to heaven then um you know major sinners and non-catholics at least that's the way it was at the time uh, uh so went to uh hell and then there was purgatory which was you were um which is basically a, a temporary hell um mm -hmm. you get some it gets the same punishments but for a temporary period and that was for um you know sinning catholics and then they had something called limbo which is no longer i don't believe is any longer a part of the doctrine but it was you know all unbaptized babies 
you know, people who, um, who died, they didn't get to go to heaven, but they didn't commit any, do anything wrong to go to hell. So they kind of lived in a different plane of existence. That's not extreme pleasure and not extreme pain. Uh huh. And so, so actually you found answer in the Bible or it wasn't convincing. Well, so that that is things a lot of um a lot of the catholic teaching let's say is extra biblical i mean so there are you you could interpret a you could come out with a purgatory interpretation from the bible um which the catholics do and you could also come out with an interpretation of a non-purgatory um with just heaven and hell which is what the protestants do um so one of well no i see what i i actually after reading the Bible, I didn't um, stay Catholic at first. So I'd read the Bible and uh, I took like extensive notes. So when I read the Bible, I, you know, everything, I had a section of a notebook and everything it said about God, a section notebook, everything it said about Jesus, a section of notebook, you know, every time I saw a verse, heaven and hell, I would write that verse down and go to it. Um, then a section where it's all the rules, all the things you should do. Then another section, all the things you shouldn't do. And then, you know, weighed them next to each other. And what mm -hmm. I found is that the teaching of the Bible and the teaching of the Catholic Church didn't match. And this is something that is um, admitted within the Catholic faith because the Catholic faith, um, you know, teaches that you know, the Bible is a source, but the Catholic Church is also a source, and the Catholic Church um, can trump the Bible. I think it's because, for example, the Pope maybe is in contact with the divine or something like that. Well, not necessarily. Only The Pope is only in contact, let's say, with the divine when he's sitting on the throne of St. Peter or the chair of St. Peter. And so that and they only do that, like, that's only been done a handful of times throughout history. So Pope is kind of more a fallible leader of the church, and let, he only becomes infallible when he's sitting on the chair of St. Peter, according to the teaching. Hmm. You know, the church as an institution um, was seen as the correct interpreters of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there it does let... It, does lend to conflict and that's actually how the protestant faith came about was um you know rejecting the authority of the church but when i read the bible eventually i became more of um you know i would describe it now as a uh unitarian biblical literist christian dominionist and now I eventually went back to Catholicism um, around, I think, 1993. There was a show called Unsolved Mysteries. And they had this, um, this episode on the uh, alleged miracles in Fatima, Portugal, the um, alleged apparitions of the Virgin Mary. And at the time, you know, that was the only miracle I was exposed to. I also wasn't exposed to as much as the other to the other side um, as well in order to, you know, it was definitely heavily one sided. So I didn't really hear too much um, criticisms of the stories or critiques. So, you know, at that age, I became convinced that that had happened. And what I age? Said, what age were you? Well, I'm going to say around 14, 13, 14. Oh, still very young. Yeah, and so I, you know, at that time I said, well, you know, the Catholics are the only ones having miracles. Um, then that must be the true religion. I said, but if it is true, I have to stop reading the Bible because, you know, there are contradictions between the two. And, you know, I was undergoing cognitive dissonance. But I went into Catholicism without the scripture and that became, it became a very um, dry and, you know, ritualistic. I was reading, but it was more just, 
you know, books on, you know, Catholic miracles and Catholic doctrine and Catholic rules and stuff like that and trying to apl apply the rules. So, you know, that was the next, let's say, five years of my life. Like, so at that time, I guess you finished high school. So, yeah, I finished high school um, and I was going to college. What did you study at college? Oh, um, a number of things. I had studied uh, history, education, physics. And what did so, you have in mind that you want to do as a job? So originally I um, wanted to become a teacher. So I did that. And then I also, then I wanted to, you know, teach martial arts. And so I, you know, had a martial arts business as well. And then I also wanted, I also um, wanted to drive exotic, you know, fancy cars, but not have to, you know, um, come out of pocket for the price. So I just start, I started an exotic car rental business too. Mm. Um, I also went into school uh, leadership and, you know, educational leadership as well. So, you know, I've done teaching, small business owning, and uh, running uh, schools. So, and then you had that question popping in your head. Okay, yeah. So, um, about a week or two before I went to college, a question popped in my head was, uh, you know, I'm doing, you know, all of these things. I'm volunteering my time in the nursing home and I'm giving 10% of my um, money, you know, from all my paychecks. I was donating it and um, I was, you know, uh, volunteering to help disabled children play baseball and stuff like that. And so I'm doing all these things. And, but the question popped in my head, you know, I didn't have any love for God in my heart. It was just, you know, I didn't want to burn in hell. So I'm doing things just to avoid that and no other reason. So it's like, you know, will God even accept um, deeds if they're not done out of love heart? That same week, I go to church, and the, the priest gives a sermon that same week, um, and the the sermon was on, you know, if your if your deeds are not done out of love for God, then He's not going to accept your deeds. So when I left that, I was like, well, you know, there's if God's not going to accept anything I do, and I'm going to hell anyway, I might as well just live a life doing whatever I want. But how do you explain this? Con uh like the synchronicity you just thought of something and then you go and you find the answer yeah um i don't you know i would say i don't have a great explanation i mean i know in the islamic context that you know it's called ilham you know like an, a divine inspiration from inside uh one of the hard parts i have though with you know all of those is that um you know, it's like, you know, so from the Muslim lens, you know, this was God putting these thoughts and ideas in your heart to guide you, right? Uh, from the Catholic angle, they would say, you know, it's the devil tricking you, right? It's the devil putting those in, in your mind to trick you to, to separate you from God. Mm -hmm. And then you, then the, then the atheists, quite often will say you're lying you're just making all this up or it's a coincidence <laughs> yeah yeah that i get too but i i mean I, I don't but i generally those three are the bigger ones you know it's god guiding you it's satan tricking you or you're a liar and you're making all this up okay mm -hmm. you know the, those third people it's just like okay have a nice day I, I, <laughs> because mm -hmm. there's really there's really like um you know, and I'm not saying all atheists, like, you know, um, yeah, come some. from that angle. Yeah. yeah, some. Okay, so now you you found that it's really difficult to go to heaven. So you just give everything up. So first, I kind of went more into a party lifestyle. And then I started to go back to church and party. And I was like, I'll keep one foot in just in case God changes his mind. <laughs> I was like, so I would, you know, I would go back to church every Sunday. And at that time, uh, 
the priests started to become a lot more liberal in their teachings. And so kind of made it like, you know, started teaching things that weren't exactly in the books of the church. It's kind of like, you know, more, uh, heaven became a lot more of a wide open door, you know, than it was in the previous books in the previous years. And it's kind of, you know, where, where these changes come from and, you know, to make so it easy the for the people, you know? Yeah. After reading the Bible, going back to the middle school years, I read books on uh, Eastern religions. I read um, a biography of Malcolm X. I read uh, the Quran, an English translation of the Quran, one of the Penguin Classics versions. I think N.J. Dawood, but I can't remember 100%. Um, I'd read a biography uh, called Muhammad, the Apostle of God. So I was very... Um, you know, familiar with a lot of religions. So I, a lot of the social studies courses, I had to take a, a non, what was called non-Western history. So I chose um, Islamic civilization. Uh, you know, I took religions of the world as a, um, you know, elective because, you know, that was the class I did best at. I got a 100% on every single exam I took. I got didn't get a question wrong the whole semester. But during that time, um, I was in Islamic Civ class and we had a guest speaker who gave a talk on Islam from the Bible and he was uh, showing, um, you know, the Hebrew language and he was showing the Aramaic language and he was showing the, the Arabic language and he was making claims about, you know, the Bible referencing uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you know, one of the things I said that I can't um, prove or disprove um, what he's saying because I don't have access to those languages. So I got you know, more into, you know, studying, um, you know, the scriptures again, as well as um, the Semitic languages, you know, in order to better um understand and see if um, any of these uh, claims are true. So I was, you know, hanging around with the, um, you know, I was hanging around with Muslims, I was hanging around with uh, more educated, um, you know, some Christians as well. And, you know, just talking, you know, talking to people about religion, you know, and I was still, you know, doing some of the parting as, well, but that was starting to, you know, I would say, phase out a little bit. So as I was studying, and I was, you know, I was, so I would be going like to the mosque on Friday and the church on Sunday, and you know, I'd be going to the Juma prayer and I'd be going to the Sunday mass, <laughs> and you know, I would, I would be, you know, mixing worship. So I was kind of practicing Catholicism, practicing Islam, and practicing neither all at the same time. And how, how did you feel at that time when you are doing all this? That's a good question. I felt I was searching, but I also felt, um, you know, you know, somewhat confused, but I also felt like I would say different at different times too. During the time, you know, it was kind of got, you know, I would say a little peer pressured into uh, or, you know, someone was very persuasive, you know, convinced me, was like, you know, telling me to take the shahada. And I was like, you know, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. And uh, we're like, just take it and the short tea will come afterwards. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, everyone has doubts as that. So I said, yeah, okay, I did it. Um, but eventually I felt that I was um, being a, uh, disingenuous because uh you know so at first like after i took my shahada i was trying to convince everyone else you know to become a muslim as well no <laughs> and then uh so i so i was doing that and you know and people would ask me questions well eventually what i had realized though is i was having a double standard so i like i was applying a higher level of criticism towards 
the Judeo-Christian text than I was towards um, the Muslim text. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, that, uh, you know, if I applied the same level of criticism, then I wouldn't um, choose any of these paths. So then after that, I'd say that's when I felt uh, really like, um, you know, down and lost um, for a period of time. And I was like, you know, did I, you know, did I just, you know, waste some of my years doing all this, et cetera, et cetera. So, I, you know, I started to have um, different thoughts, but I guess then a third question came up. This one, I wouldn't say is a pop in your head question. It was more just, you know, something I thought about. And it was, you know, because I was feeling unhappy. So I wanted to know, like, what, you know, what was the path in life that would lead towards, you know, maximal human happiness? And so that got me on a more um, experimental phase where I was, um, you know, studying different things, analyzing claims, trying different things out, um, basically, you know, conducting experiments on myself. To see what, what would make you happy and not just not to analyze too much, like what is true what is not true well kind of i would say not i I would say not just what makes me happy Mm -hmm. but i was looking at um you know the maximal levels of human happiness because like one of the things that i um see in the world is that a lot of the major problems that are we're experiencing in the world is because of individuals trying to make themselves happy but not but at the expense of everyone else and we find that so much of human happiness is linked to um, family and we talked about the difference in um, the theoretical legal systems between for example the islamic legal system and i would say some of the western um, legal theories. Uh, the Islamic legal theory is, focuses more on preservation, whereas the Western legal theories focus more on freedoms. Um, and both have their advantages and disadvantages. But, you know, quite often the freedom, you know, comes at the expense of promoting family uh, and, you know, the stabilization of families. You know, subjectively and measurably, you know, better for all, everyone's human happiness. Yeah, because I'm from the Arabic world, so it is not so much uh, accepted for someone to get divorced. It's, it's not like as welcomed as maybe in the West. Yeah. And, you know, that has its pros and cons, but one of the things that... uh you know, I would say about it's not just limited to the um, marriage and divorce, but when you look at like the way um, in which um, divorce occurs, or if you look at the rights and responsibilities of the husband and wife, Islam lays it all out. And the way Islam lays it all out totally matches the research in other fields so mm-hmm. for so for example in the west the top four um reasons for divorce and not necessarily in any order are adultery um incompatibility when it comes to marital intimacy uh financial stress and then the fourth one is communication so when you actually look at to the way um, that Islam delineates the roles, rights, and responsibilities of the husband and wife and primary versus secondary roles. So it's, um, you know, the primary responsibility of the husband is to ensure the financial stability of the family. That's the number one 
you know, after religion, that's the number one role of the husband. Doesn't mean, you know, that the wife can't contribute financially, but it's not her responsibility. The number one responsibility of the wife um, in Islam is to ensure and maintain the marital intimacy. Now, that's also a role for the husband, too, but it's not the number one role. So if you actually just look at what the number one job is for the husband, what the number one job is for the wife, that knocks out three of the top four reasons um, that people get divorced in the West. Now, communication, hey, that's something that yeah, uh, has, to be, has to be worked on, right? But mm-hmm. just you know, making this is the priority, this is your primary job, and this is what's in the books, and this is what you're taught, and you know it, like, and you know it's your responsibility if the husband does his number one job, the wife does her number one job, the marriage is happy and stays together, you know, and the children learn from that. Let me just make sure that I understand. So mm-hmm. you already you were already introduced to Islam and mm-hmm. uh, from this lecture, Islam from the Bible. And mm-hmm. you found that there are other languages like Aramic and Arabic that you don't know. And you wanted to dig deep into those so you can understand. But then when you had this question that is... Uh, like what is the path to happiness you started looking into into religions in a different way like what religion is going to set foundation for a a happy life or a more stable life and that's how you started looking into islam i would say that's how i started looking into everything that's i think that was the final thing that had me choose um islam as opposed to, um, yeah, so I guess when I first, when I first took my Shahada, I wouldn't say I was really Muslim. I was kind of more like talked into it, right? Um, you know, I was, you know, with a group of people and I was like, you know, I wasn't hundred percent sure. And they were like, you know, um, you know, take your Shahada and then like, you know, work on the doubts and, you know, the questions you have and the law go away. Um, so I said, okay, but it didn't work. And so, you know, I wanted to be as intellectually and morally consistent as possible. And I found that, you know, when dealing in the interreligious, um, world, the Christian Muslim dialogue is that, uh, when Christians critique, not all, but, you know, this was a pattern you know, when people who are Christian, for example, critique Islam, they those same arguments they used against the Muslims, they could use against their own, but they don't, they don't. And I saw that when the Muslims critique the Christians, like the same arguments that they u- used against the Christians, they could use against themselves, but didn't. Um, and I felt, you know, very disingenuous and morally inconsistent in that type of environment. So that when I, you know, if I felt like I applied both criticisms equally and fairly, you know, it left me with no religion, I would say at the time. Yeah. So how did you solve this? So I I went into, I, you know, my next question was, became the, um, about, um, you know, which way of life, um, you know, was the path to human happiness. And I, that's, you know, kind of went off more on my own and started um, trying things as well as, um, you know, studying different things, studying different claims, trying out their claims, you know, seeing if it worked, uh, you know, so that, you know, led, you know, that led me. Um, and I would say once I got more into I, th- I would say it was a combination of intellect and experience. So the, mm. you know, the intellectual part of things, you know, that I'm kind of, you know, referring to when you look at, um, for example, the, the family structure, uh, we see that family structure is one of the greatest correlations to human happiness. Yeah, um, so you told me this. So you started comparing how's the family and the 
Western house, the family under the Islamic religion. Yeah, and you found so, that it makes more sense in the Islamic religion. Yeah, I, I feel like Islam deals with reality. So, like the Islamic legal system, you know, deals with the way things are. Um, and then there is this, you know, the spiritual side, the tizkiyat, the sawuf, you know, working towards, you know, different people use different terms or like terms or don't like a term, but, um, you know, the tizkiyat, the, you know, purification, tizkiyat nefs, purification of the self, you know, works more towards the ideal. But then you got the sharia that works more towards the, you know, the what is, the what is, you know, real. So, you know, it gives options. There are options, for example, in the legal system like that, you know, if someone is found guilty beyond the shadow of doubt of murder, um, you know, that person, you know, is put to death, which brings justice to the family. But the family also has the option of forgiving and taking payment. So they can go to the higher level as well. But it gives Islam deals with reality and gives both options, the option for mm -hmm. justice or the option for um forgiveness but it leaves it leaves both there so it deals in reality we were talking about like you had mentioned about how you know divorce is not as acceptable let's say in egypt as it is in the united states um and that's aggravating. one of the things i find really interesting about you know there is the regular divorce you know in islam which is the right of the husband and you have a second type of divorce, uh, hula, which, you know, is the wife giving back the dowry in exchange, you know, for no longer being married. And what we find, what I find interesting when you look at a lot of the um, disaster in the divorce system, you know, where I grew up, which is being rectified um, at the moment, you know, was still not enough was that in the divorce right now, um, eight out of every 10 divorces in um, the West at this time are initiated by women. Only two out of every 10 are initiated by men. Mm -hmm. also, within, also within our divorce system, 50-50. So if, you know, we have a household income of $200,000, you know, the husband gets a hundred thousand dollars and the wife gets a hundred thousand. Now it varies by country and state and stuff like that. Um, but I'm just using a simple example. You know, so then the husband and the wife both leave with a hundred thousand dollars, you know, regardless of who was the breadwinner. So, you know, what I also find it, you know interesting is for most time it was men making most money. Um now there are cases now where women are making more money and having to pay the man and now they don't like it. Um, and a lot of men still won't take from women, even though um, the American system gives them that right. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, we're starting to see a, a reversal now that um, some women are making more than they're, and they're trying to get divorced and they're having to pay. Um, you know, they don't like it, but for a long time it was, the woman was leaving and leaving with half the man's money. Right. And so that, that incentivized um, women to break up the family and still get, you know, financial benefit. Whereas mm -hmm. in the Islamic way of doing things, you know, the, the, initiator of divorce you know is the right of the man as we see statistically men don't do it that often you know mm -hmm. two out of every you know about half the marriages in the united states end in divorce and out of those half only 20 percent are initiated by men so it's very um rare that men file for divorce now in the the uh hula where the woman um was for divorce so in islam in order for a man to marry he gives a dowry and it, if the woman wants to leave she has to give that dowry back so the financial incentive right for divorce 
has already been worked out prior in the details. So the whole system and structure of the Islamic law um, has a lot of foresight into, you know, dealing with reality and it's, it's preventative. So Islam is more like preventative medicine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like you, you know, it's better to, you know, diet and exercise to keep your body healthy. That's better than going to the doctor and getting a medication or a surgery. Now, mm -hmm. if you need a medication or a surgery, and you've done all that, like, that's just part of life. I Islam is preventive on the front end. And you see a lot of the problems, um, you know, Muslims face is when they either don't, like, know or understand, like, the rulings or the reasons behind them, or they know and they go against them. Then you see um, problems, but you don't see as many problems um, you know, when, when people have knowledge um, of the Islamic uh, legal and spiritual systems and they implement them. And I know that you started uh, studying Arabic as well and you went into usul al-fiqh and you, but, but is your Arabic, uh, like what level is your Arabic? Uh, so I would like come and goes right now, I would say, uh, I would say over the past 10 years, my Arabic level is very uh, low, just some academic vocabulary. Um, I would say most of my studying of the Arabic language was done prior to um, 2013. I would say once I, once I got a, um, once I started having a, a lot of kids and um, working, um, responsibilities like, you know working a lot to provide for the family and I don't work around anyone who uses Arabic at all I would say you know it comes and goes but right now I would say it mostly goes <laughs> okay so I will come back to uh, to also what else you like caught your attention in Islam but I want to talk about relationships so I see you went into different phases in life, and I'm sure that this affected relationships. So can you take me on a on a journey with you on your relationships? And I know now you are married to a Jordanian, right? Yes. Okay. So take me on the journey of relationships. So um, yeah, that's interesting. So you know, like. You had um, a few, you know, friends went to high school, but, you know, in America, a lot of times we go away to college. Uh, so, you know, when I went away to college, you know, so I had, uh, you know, joined a fraternity and, you know, I was, you know, having a lot of fun. Once I decided to become Muslim, though, uh, I lost most of my, uh, friends like mo or you know so-called friends most of the people i was friends with um you know when you took the shahad the first time yes that yes. was in your 20s let's say ah uh, no no late teens ah so you lost your friends hmm. and then um so that you know that had happened uh i had you know acquired some new friends somewhat in the muslim community but it was different. Um, the non-Muslim friends, like you go out and you do things a lot. Um, whereas, you know, with the Muslim friends, you saw them at the masjid and you gave salams and you said goodbye. Or you saw them at the Muslim Students Association and, you know, you, uh, you know, maybe talked there, ate some books and then, you know, they went home. So it was a different, it wasn't really the going out type of friendships. Um, so, you know, that was challenging period. Um, but I did make, yeah, I did make some new friends, but, uh, I think about one of the challenges is, you know, the, a lot of the friends I made in the Muslim community, um, the Muslim community in America, New Jersey is very transient. People move around a lot. So, you know, I have friends that have moved to Jordan, friends that have moved to, uh, Gambia, Senegal. I have mm. friends, you know, that have like, so I would say a lot of the friendships, you know, within the Muslim community 
are temporary. They come and go because people move around a lot. But you're um, talking about friends, like I'm talking about relationships. Oh, you're talking about like male female relationships? Yes. I guess it was difficult because you changed your beliefs many times. Yeah, well, also I find that um it, one of the challenges um or so I you know, so one of the things that I so I know that when I um first got married, you know, and, and settled down, I was in my 20s and I got, you know, I got married to um a uh Muslim who was the daughter of converts. So she was born and raised Muslim, but her parents, um, you know, had converted to Islam. Uh, you know, so we were, you know, married for a number of years. Um, you know, it didn't, and that, uh, you know, eventually, um, didn't work out. And then, um, you know, eventually, was it I, the, yeah. was it the cause of the communication? Yes, um, that's the only one left. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily feel totally comfortable getting into, um, you know. Uh, no, just previous, yeah, uh, yes or no, yeah. like because you said um, when because yeah, both of you are Muslims, right? So yes, yeah, all communication the three is, reasons doesn't yeah, exist. Yeah, communication is a uh, a. Um, a struggle uh, you know it's i would say that's an ongoing challenge yeah <laughs> okay so that was the first relation and then you know so back um i would say when i you know was muslim early on that you know at those times you know it was you know a lot more challenging in some ways to find a spouse uh than it is now it's challenging in different ways um, now. Um, so back then, I would say the challenge was more ethnic and racial, you know, whereas I would say, you know, in the 2020s, uh, families have a lot less of those issues. And, and it's more, because um, I think that so many people in the West you know, like back then it used to be, um, I'm looking for a, I'll just make this up, uh, someone, you know, a Hyderabad Indian with a PhD, you know, for my daughter, or I'm looking for someone from, uh, you know, Palestine from the Hanini tribe, uh -huh. you know, for my daughter. Right? it was very much like that. Uh, I would say in the now like a lot of families are basically i just want my child to marry a muslim so uh -huh. <laughs> you know they're like they're like i don't care what tribe what color or what you know and i'm not saying that none of these things exist or or that there weren't people like that back then but it's a lot different now um in that because i think what ended up happening was was so many of these uh families from back then had such so you're you're moving your child to america where only about three and a half percent of the population is muslim and then you know stating on top of that that they can't just marry any muslim it has to be mm -hmm. from the same uh ethnic the same tribe and set and then a career limitation so it puts so many limitations on it became really difficult for people to get married. And, you know, so people either stayed single for longer, ended up marrying someone who wasn't Muslim and like, or ended up stopping the religion or they, they, they also said they're Muslim, but you know, whatever. Um, and so that the, the, I think that a whole generation of people saw that and was just like, all right, like, you know, that, uh, now we just want our, our child to marry Muslim. We don't care if they're Egyptian or Pakistani or Desi or white or black or this, that. Do they, you know, do they pray? Do they have a career? You know, can they get along? It's, it's done a full like 180 over the 30 um, something years. So how, what is your story? 
with your Jordanian wife? So we had met, um, you know, uh, you know, communicated through the masjid and online. And then, uh, you know, I had spoke, you know, to her family as well. Her family was basically more the type that, uh, you know, if they're Muslim, they're practicing and they're praying. Um, like that's, that's the requirement for a spouse. Like, uh, you know, so they kind of live more along the, uh, you know, she comes from a very strict, uh, you know, conservative family. Like her mother is the type that, uh, um, prays, uh, to head you every night. Mm -hmm. Then, um, then does, you know, dhikr after Fajr and recites Surat al Baqarah after Asr every day. So I would say, you know, the marriage overall was, you know, very easy to uh, facilitate. So, you know, we spoke for, I would say, maybe a, a year and then got, and then we got married and um, say we had our first child um, within less than two years and you know start working on our family mm, how many children you have now so her and i have uh two and then another on the way and i also mm -hmm. have um daughter from my previous marriage mm -hmm. okay so that's your relationship story <laughs> uh, now going back to I know that you have a challenge, Islam lifestyle challenge. Yeah, the 40 day 40 Islamic days. challenge. Yeah. 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 So because what led you to Islam is observation, you looked at the lifestyle and you found that it's more practical, it's more related to reality, it makes sense. So is it is this challenge uh, is based on that? I uh yeah, so I said that part of my journey was experiential and part of it was intellectual. So the 40-day Islamic challenge is more the experiential part. Uh, it's something comparable to what I did. It's not exactly with what I did because I refined it, you know, in order to make the challenge. But it's very similar to, um, you know, the experiential part of my journey. Mm -hmm. So... If someone wants to try this challenge, can you tell me what what are the requirements? Yeah, so basically, um, it's uh, you know I'm doing this from memory, but it's forty day. Um, it's just giving up forty days of your life and um, living as a Muslim. So praying five times a day, um, replacing uh, you know time you listen to music, let's say, with replacing that with lectures and Quran and, you know, dhikr, um, you know, trying to go, you know, to the mosque and pray as often as possible. No alcohol. Yeah, giving up alcohol, you know, uh, pork, if that's something that you eat, and, you know, et cetera, and just living, and then also journaling. So journaling how you feel the day before, um, your happiness levels, your mood levels, and journaling each day throughout the 40 days. And then should you choose to go back after the 40 days, you know, like journaling um, for another 40 days. So you can compare in 40 day increments what your life experience um, and happiness levels were, you know, through the practice of Islam and through not practicing Islam. Mm -hmm. Okay, I wonder, can you give me an example of uh, now, as you are already practicing Islam, what are things in your life that became, let's say, easier or happier? Um, I would say easier and, and happier. Um, I, I think that the five daily prayers are a time out. Um, you know, when you're stressed and you go, you know, you make the wudu and you pray. Um, I would definitely say uh, 
Ramadan, like all the iftars, the um, uh, I would say a lot of the academic discourse. Um, also, I think the company you keep, like when you're around practicing Muslim company, you feel better inside. You you engage in more um, wholesome intellectual conversations. You know, having a common book or rules to go back to in your relationship, uh, you know, makes things easier, you know, when you, you both have a common goal. Um, you know, some of the relationships I've seen fail is both, you know, like the husband wants to do what he wants to do, the wife wants to do what she wants to do, but they don't have a common um, ground to go back to to determine, okay, you know, in this scenario, who who's right, right? Uh, so having a common um, book to go back to, it uh, alleviates a lot of the challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I would say that Islam is a very intellectually stimulating rela uh, religion. You know, like, so you have the four schools of Sunni law that are, you know, to sort of learn, you know, compare the differences, the history behind them, how they come. So I think it's it's constantly stimulating uh, intellectually. It, it's kind of like a big puzzle. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that there's the blend of the intellectual stimulation, the stimulation of the uh, spiritual heart or the emotional centers, the um, a lot more wholesome activities, um, you know, to engage in. Because a lot of times when you're not Muslim, a lot of the default fun is, you know, surrounds alcohol and other things. And it's easy to go to, right? Like, to whereas the, you know, the Muslims have a lot more variety, I would say, in their social life. Mm -hmm. What about your name, the Farus? Does it have a uh, meaning? So it actually just started off as a joke. Um, you know, so uh, we were playing around. It's not actually my name. It's kind of just a YouTube pseudonym. Uh, and uh, it kind of it's kind of just started off as a joke. Um, and uh, but there is, there are actually uh, meanings in other languages because uh, I was like, you know, playing around. My, my wife was like, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean anything. I was like, I guarantee you it means something like, somewhere in the world. And so I just made it up. I was like, yeah, I made it up as a joke, but, um, you know, I bet you it does mean something. So we did find out that, um, you know, it does uh, exist in um, some of the uh, Desi languages as uh, a man of wisdom or a man of chivalry. No, and that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> but you don't have a Muslim name. Well, you know, according to... Um, you know, the Sharia, there are five uh, categories of names and any one that, um, so the first name is, uh, category is Fard, which, you know, it's Fard to have, you know, a name uh, that's not Haram, basically, which I, I'll go into that. And then there's... Uh, so Fard means obligatory. Obligatory, yes. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, next, so I'll go just to the English terms then, um, Recommended would be the next category. So it's recommended to have a name that has a good meaning. Uh, then there's um, the names that are permissible, which are names of neutral meanings. Um, there's forbidden names, which names that either have um, that con the connotation is worship of another god. And then there's the um, discouraged name, which is a name with a bad meaning or a name with an overly pious meaning. Um, and so all the names that fit within. Um, so uh, my name, my birth name, Michael, fits within the first three categories because we didn't find um, name change really within the early days of Islam that frequently. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when people when people became Muslim, like all and except for like 
a handful of instances. You know, they kept whatever their birth name was. And the handful of instances are how we know those, um, we derive those categories. So, um, you know, there was, there were names like, um, Abdul Shems, uh, slave of the sun. Yeah. Uh, um, Abdul Masih, uh, you know, slave of the Christ. Uh, Abdul Uzza or Abdul Lat, uh, yeah. you know, stuff like that, um, that were service to another God. So, um, those names, you know, were changed. So, you know, within the, um, Islamic teaching, you know, all names that fit in the first three categories are Muslim names. So, you know, it became later that, um, it was during the Caliphate of Omar that the, or the concept of a Muslim name became more, um, common. So your name is still Michael. Yes. Uh huh. That's very interesting. <laughs> when someone converts to a, a religion, there is always this challenge of so you have Shia, Sunnah, Ahmadiyya. So how how was this for you? Um, I would say that that uh was a challenge. I think part of the reason um that I had learned so much and kind of went into the direction of um learning usul al fiqh is because when i um you know became muslim you know you had one masjid that was on a da'wah salafiyah movement then you had another masjid that was the ikhwan muslimin movement and another masjid was the hizb al tahrir and then the other masjid that was uh or group that was uh the shadali tariqa and students of uh Jake knew Hamim Keller, and then you had others that were, uh, you know, more the mainstream traditional following um, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and you know Zaid Shaker, and then you had the you know the more the general Muslims, you know, that were, um, you know, in the community of like Imam Suraj Bahad. So I was constantly um, in the middle of all of these different, uh, and then we had the, the Shia, and then later I learned about the um, Qibadi. But uh, we were, you know, in the middle of a lot of these different uh, Muslim groups um, that had, I think they all agree in way like 90 something percent, but that less than, that, you know, less than 5% or 10%, um, you know, became the focus a lot of a lot of the disagreements or arguments. So I'd wanted to know, um, you know, where, you know, okay, when, like, what does everyone agree upon? You know, where do they disagree upon? And then why, how and why do they disagree upon it? So, you know, that kind of led me down to, um, you know, study, like, learning the uh, usul al fiqh um, learning comparative uh, learning, um, you know, textual history, uh, you know, so that, and I would say that I, I would say I wound up more on, um, the independent side. What is that? I don't get, try, I don't get involved in trying to ascribe myself and saying I'm this or that, uh, you know, I look at who has the most textual and historical evidence and follow that rather than say, you know, I'm this or I'm that or I'm part of this group or this denomination. Hmm. So does this mean that you are the source of fatwa? Like if no. you need the consultation or something, you give it to yourself or you or you go to someone? So it was interesting. So I started studying, I would say, independently and going to someone. Um, and then I had studied, uh, you know, Shafi'i fiqh um, with uh, Sheikh um, Abdullah al Fawala Dimishqi. Uh, and then I had studied, um, you know, the Usul al Fiqh with uh, Dr. Qatanani. And um, and, you know, and I continued uh, to study um, independently. 
but I guess it varies on the question, right? Because I mean, I have the texts of the four Medehib, or you know, a number of them, obviously not all of them, um, you know, to reference, uh, and then I have some of the texts from the other um, movements to reference. So, you know, the majority of um, things I generally can look up uh, for myself. Um, when it comes to a new issue, um, I try, I don't stick to one like person. Like I'll look up myself uh, and I could ask a number of people of a, a number mm -hmm. of different, you know, what they say and what what their reasoning is. And then, you know, choose um, a accordingly based upon what I'm most, uh, uh -huh. you know, convinced of. Yeah. But, th but this makes me think, why is it so difficult to find the right way? I mean, you had to, you had to put a lot of effort in this. And most people don't. Most people are just busy with their daily lives and... So how do you explain this? Like, why do we have, if, if, like, if I want to find the right way, I need to research, I need to study, I need to investigate. Why do you think God made it difficult? You know, that's um, a good, that's a great question. And I mean, I don't totally have an answer, but I could make, I could make one up that makes sense. <laughs> and so the one I make of it makes sense is that, you know, one of the things that I, I've observed in life is almost everything good that everyone ever achieves is something they had to work hard for. And every like, and then when I, I also observe that people who are, who are given, um, that are given everything but uh like they didn't work hard for it they either blow it or don't appreciate it or so i'll give you an example um i know that wealth in families on average you know last two generations you know mm -hmm. so there are exceptions like the saudi royal family is, is an exception probably uh you know, the Medici family in Spain. Um, and that just seems to be uh, a theme that, you know, the highest in every field are people who like, who work the hardest for things. And it just seems to be, um, you know, there's a verse in the Quran that states that, you know, um, man will have only what they strive for, what they work hard for. But also you have that uh, in Arabic, it's uh, Allahu yahdi man yashay. So God will guide you to the way. So, so it's not just you, how hard you work, but also it's the guidance of God. Yes, and they seem to go. They seem to go hand in hand, like for how? the most part. So it's like, uh, you know, if if you're like if you're searching, let's say, and you put the effort in. Um, uh, you know, God, uh, you know, facilitates, you know, that for you. Like in the United States, like Benjamin Franklin had a statement, um, you know, God help, um, helps those who help themselves. You know, it's like, so if I just sit around all day and pray for food, mm -hmm. but I don't get up and go to work, mm -hmm. like, you know, the food is not going to come. But then also if, you know, I'm constantly, sometimes you can constantly work hard and you have no opening. It's just doors closed in your face. Yeah. And then, and then you're frustrated. But then sometimes you pray, and then some random door opens somewhere else that you had no clue was, you know, coming. And then you understand later, you know, why. Mm -hmm. But then, the, but a lot of times, though, the effort and skill that you put into it transfers into that new door that opens. Mm -hmm. And in your understanding of islam people who couldn't find the way of islam where you think 
they will go. So um, there's a uh, narration that, um, you know, speaks about, you know, people that, you know, were not exposed and that, uh, you know, that God is going to give them a uh, test um, in the afterlife. And if they, uh, you know, pass, then they'll be, you know, of the people of heaven. And if they fail, they'll be of hell. And that, uh, and the argument is going to be that, um, you know, when they sent, uh, so in the, in the hadith, it speaks about, you know, um, the people are going to complain that, you know, they didn't receive a message. And so God's going to send them a messenger that's going to command them to do something. And those who do it, you know, will be a, the people of paradise. And those who don't, you know, are going to complain. Um, and the argument from God is going to be like, you know, if, you know, if you didn't obey, you know, the messenger in the afterlife, when you can see the afterlife, like what makes you think that you would have been, you know, done it your whole time on earth without seeing everything mm -hmm. i see as you know this is my journey to understand life mm -hmm. and uh, i would like to see what answers you have for the mysterious questions or what i call the mysterious questions so let's start with the question that took you on all this journey which is what will happen if i die now so what do you believe now the answer of this question so you know as um a muslim you know the question of what happens uh when you die is that you know you meet your creator and you're accountable for you know however you lived your life here on this planet and um what about the love of god because this was also another question that you had what if i do good things but not coming out of love for god see in, in islam there are different uh levels and so you know all the levels are you know considered acceptable uh, just some are better than others. So, you know, in Islam, there are people who don't do um, bad things just for the sake of, you know, avoiding punishment. And that's okay. There are some people who do things um, solely for good reasons and not to avoid any um, punishment. And or certainly uh, solely for pleasure, not to avoid punishment, and that's okay. And then there are people who do things, um, you know, out of uh, love, and that's a higher level. But all three levels are considered acceptable within the Islamic paradigm. Mm -hmm. What about the question, uh, where did we come from? How do you answer that? So, you know, in the Quran, it states, you know, from Allah we came into. Uh, him we shall return. So, you know, before, um, you know, I came to this planet, I was a soul in a body, you know, um, you know, the soul entered my body. And when I die, the, you know, the soul will exit my body. And when we're resurrected, it will be connected again to a new body. Oh. So, okay, so the body will be even after life. Yes, but it won't be the same type of body that, you know, breaks down and gets old and, you know, all these other. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Okay. And what is the meaning of this experience that we are having? So that's very interesting. So in the Quranic uh, purpose of existence, you know, it's to uh, serve your creator. There's, you know, two verses in the Quran that, you know, speak about the purpose of uh, why we're here. And one is to serve uh, your creator. And the other is, um, you know, to develop uh, awe of him. And, uh, you know, 
through that service, you know, you're making the world a better place. Um, and then, you know, biologically, you know, this is not in the Quran, but, you know, the, when you look at biologically, you know, we're here to prepare, you know, the next generations as well. You know, so, and, you know, one of the, uh, the hadith speak about, you know, having righteous children that will pray for you when you're gone. Um, and also there's a hadith that states if the day of judgment comes and, you know, you're uh, planting a tree, you know, finish planting it. So, you know, there is the concept of, you know, service, you know, serving God, serving uh, humanity. And then, you know, there's also, you know, the natural selfishness, which is considered okay, because, you know, in the Quran, it says, you know, save yourself and your family from a fire whose fuel is men in stones. But it starts with yourself. So when we're born, we're born with a natural selfishness. You know, we cry when we want something. We don't think about is our mother sleeping or, you know, all of these other things. <laughs> what you mean is that God created life and we are here to serve him and serve others. Correct. And in the process, develop uh, tukla, you know, or awe of God. To be aware or conscious of of the existence of God and and uh, what is he creating and how how amazing it is yeah and that increases through service and worship whichever you know translation you prefer mm -hmm. uh, but how do you explain suffering it could be a removal of a wrong action um or it could be um, a reward of instead of greater uh, suffering. Like they say, it could have been worse. So yes. this is uh, <laughs> so this is of less harm. Uh huh. So we are suffering because it it could have been worse. So we should be thankful for what we have. And what else? Why we are suffering? Um, also, you know, we may have done things uh, that are wrong. And so some of the su so suffering can be a test. It can be a punishment or it could be a reward. So the suffering, and, you know. Go ahead. Well, what is the like when you say this, how do you explain the suffering of a baby, for example? So, you know. That would be, that could be, um, well, it would fit under the same paradigm. So, you know, within the, um, you know, Islamic paradigm, you know, if the infant dies, you know, suffers and dies, it gets an everlasting reward, you know, for the short term suffering. Uh, when it comes to, yeah, so. Mm hmm. So if you suffer in life, then you get rewarded after life, maybe. Or during. Or during life. Uh -huh. yeah. mm -hmm. Or some types of suffering are, you know, the results of what you do as well. So it depends. It's not like a one size fits all answer. Uh -huh. So maybe I did something wrong and then I get like a, a punishment for it. So that I don't get the bigger punishment in the afterlife, for example. Yes. Mm -hmm. I see. And how can people uh, follow you or find what you are doing? So I still left about 40 videos up on um, my YouTube page, 40-some uh, videos called uh, The First Explains Islam. I used to have 150. Some of them are still up there, but they're, you know, unlisted. So if they're in playlists or whatever, um, I've kept about, uh, you know, 40 up there. Um, you know, I also have a recommended, uh, reading list for people. Um, so one is, uh, the book, how to make it in today's world, a modern Muslim survival guide. I recommend mm -hmm. that. Um, then, uh, you know, people can, uh, contact me, you know, 
through the uh, YouTube channel. You can get a direct access to email. You just have okay. to go to the the about section and uh, it'll check to see if you're a bot or not. And then if you pass the bot test, then, okay. then it'll allow you to email me directly. Yeah, we will leave a link in the description. Okay, it was so much pleasure to talk to you and document your life in the scrapbook of life. And yeah, I think you went on a not easy journey, uh, taking into consideration that you are in a society that is not familiar with the Islam when you started looking. <laughs> so thank you for being here. And thank you for having me and it was a pleasure talking to you as well. On my journey to understand life, I would like to meet you and document your life story in the scrapbook of life. Send a summary of the story to the email in the description box or the show notes. Just few requirements. You need to be over 40 years old, you changed your belief, and you have answers to the mysterious questions of life. This journey of mine started when I met Wang Tsong Yang in a documentary film, and you can watch it below. My thirst to answers is pushing me to discover and meet more people who are living this life experience to the best possible way, through their own belief. Who is next? And which belief? I'm open to all possibilities.